Hi, my lovely tarot tribe um, and my witchy pants. It's Ethany, and today I have the amazing um, Benabel Wen here to talk about her new book, this deluxe, gorgeous, thick book um, called The Tarot of Craft. Um, and many of you will know her as the author of Holistic Tarot, which is also sitting on my bookshelf uh, and I'm so so happy to have you to uh, have a chat to everyone on my channel and on my newsletter and just people who stumble across this. so welcome hey Anthony Hi. For having me. so tell us a little bit about how you went from writing the mother of all I mean for people who haven't I've, I've got to get it out literally an arm's length reach for me oh. the mother of all tarot books um holistic tarot I mean check that out folks if you don't have this book do yourself a favor um how did you go from writing this massive tome on tarot to writing the tale of craft um, I guess there's two different answers I could, you know, respond with. I guess the first more logistical one is after the, after Holistic Tarot, I got to work on a book on feng shui. But I was thinking of, you know, somehow find writing at the intersection of tarot and feng shui. So it wasn't going to be just strictly feng shui. I didn't really hash it out yet. And then a small section of it was on feng shui cures, which is basically a form of magic or crap using kawa sigils. So I started on that section and it really just you know, into its own book. So I started a separate manuscript and that's how the Tao of Craft came about. Um, the other answer is, I think I was just called to it. Like if you're a writer, you know, like some things you just really feel pulled to it. And even though on a conscious level, I was very resistant. I didn't really want to write it. On a conscious level, I knew it didn't make sense in terms of my own author platform, Mark, like all of the real reasons it doesn't make sense to write this book. But, you know, it came and it is what it is. So. Fantastic. Um, so now I know, and I'm sure a lot of us have just realized that we've been saying feng shui wrong. For <laughs> oh, really? No, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's but, but you say it so much nicer. No. <laughs> It's like when you see uh, like these parodies of like Australians going to um, to France and going parlez-vous français. Like it just must sound so grating to you when someone says that. You're like, oh, no, that's not what I'm saying. Um, so that's really really interesting because I don't know. I mean, I didn't know. Um, certainly didn't know that there was a magical aspect there so how, I mean how does that work because people when I think of um feng shui I think of like making sure that things are facing certain ways or I know that like facing north and having your room in an energetically aligned space and I think that's pretty much where my knowledge of it stops so can you tell us a little bit about um yeah I guess educate me a little bit about of where this, this deep magical connection well, feng shui is all of that. You know, it is the idea that basically the foundational principle behind feng shui is that there's qi energy. There's an unseen life force and how it flows through, you know, the various landscape is like whether it, you know, flows past a rock, um, a concrete building, a waterfall, like it's going to modify that qi energy in certain ways. And there's this idea, it's almost like acupuncture, where various points of your hand or various points of your foot, that's reflexology, um, correspond with the rest of the body, right? And so various parts of a living space that you've occupied um, is going to correspond with different areas of life. And how qi energy flows through those, you know, different points is going to have an effect, a metaphysical right. effect on your life. And that's going to manifest in physical ways. And so the idea of a food talisman is pretty much the same thing. The idea is that it becomes a battery of energy. So you're charging a battery of energy, of chi energy, and putting it someplace so that when the life force flows near it, past or whatever, it's going to modify it in a way that you want it to. So it kind of goes hand in hand if you understand the foundational principle behind it, right? It's all just energy and the food talisman, even though we think of it as magic, it's just a form of energy that's very, very, in, you know, intense and potent that's going to affect one's life. Awesome. And that's so true for so many different um, traditions, right? That it is all energy, whether you call it chi or universal life force or the force, you know, or whatever it is. It's, it's, that's an incredibly um, 
connecting thing right from all traditions from all over the world we all just have our way of seeing it absolutely so was this really um was this an exciting thing to be able to share um your culture or did you feel like it how did how did that feel about going and really delving into into the to that huh so I was really hoping the book already existed out there on the market. Then I could justify not writing it. And not <laughs> that sounds weird, but I, I mean, I was very resistant to put it out there only because there was a lot. I mean, writing the book means that I'm also in a presumptive way revealing a lot about myself and about my practice, my personal approach and where I stand. And I just felt like that really wasn't, a, I mean, I just wasn't there yet in terms of wanting to be like, oh, hi, I really believe in you know, craft. I practice various forms of ceremonial magic. These were the things I was really ready to showcase yet. And the book presumes that knowledge, right? So basically, I have to say that in order to have this book out there. But that's why I didn't want to write it. Interesting. That's a, that's a very interesting, <laughs> just, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. You have to kind of stand in, in that and own that and kind of say okay well this is I know what I'm talking about <laughs> so can um does this have any because I have ha had this book for a little while now but I'm uh, talking to it as if this is someone who has never come across this book before oh, cool. is there any interaction or crossover with traditions like the tarot with this work um with tarot what I had said in there so one thing that some practitioners will do, and again, you can't, you can't really make broad generalizations. It's just like saying what's paganism, right? You can't really, you know, make a broad stroke generalization, but some practitioners will use a form of divination to sort of um, affirm whether or not the sigil they've crafted is you know, the right sigil or whether or not it's going to be effective. So after they've crafted the sigil through all of their processes, they'll basically try to contact the divine or you know, through a divination just to be like, yes, this works, or no, this is not the right sigil. And so there are certain forms of traditional divination that's used in, in uh, Taoist magical traditions. But I said that the modern or the Western practitioners can use tarot. And because tarot is such an integral part of my practice in my life, I'll use the tarot. You know? And so when I'm interacting with my concept of divinity, I'll use tarot. Awesome. How do you feel about... Um cultural appropriation uh how do you feel about say someone like me who is as white as you get um <laughs> coming to this to this practice um so in the book i talk about the foundational 13 principles that govern how craft is practiced you know and in there, if you read it carefully, there's nothing on it that talks about lineage, tradition, or affiliation. Mm -hmm. So some of the things, even within the culture of uh, ceremonial magic in the uh, Taoist tradition, I would argue is wrong in terms of like, you have to be a priest or priestess to practice sigil. If you look back to the earliest, you know, you really become historian and you look back at the earliest texts by alchemists talking about sigil crafting, nowhere does it say you need to, you know, inherit it from a tradition or inherit it from a master. It's about your connection to the divine. And if anything, there's something very radical about Taoist magic and esoteric Taoism, which is that any anybody can sort of transcend that emperor designation. You know, before only the emperor can connect to the divine, the heavenly the heavenly mandate. The idea of esoteric uh, Taoism is that anybody can, anybody has, can gain the favor of heaven through certain practices. And so that's why I don't believe that that's true. Now, the second point is Taoist, Taoist magic itself is very eclectic. If you look at it, they draw in so much Buddhism, some of the most uh, long-standing traditions and lineages, which you'll think of like as Golden Dawn or OTO, that's mm -hmm. Eastern um, yeah. counterpart, they are so Buddhist in terms of the um, invocations, in terms of a lot of their practices, incredibly Buddhist. They also bring in a lot of Hinduism, mm -hmm. and as it goes into the various um, Chinese diasporas, leaving the Chinese mainland, you get um, integrated with you know, Shintoism and a lot of the local religions of Southeast Asia. And now, especially um, after the Qing dynasty, some of the practices have sort of even merged with Christianity because there is a long history of Christian evangelism in China. So it does merge with Christianity. 
So I think, you know, to sort of bring together many different cultures is part and parcel to Taoist magic. It's mm -hmm. part of its history and legacy to sort of blend. Now, in terms of cultural appropriation, I just don't think it's cultural appropriation if it's something you've adopted as a spiritual practice. As long as it's something spiritual, then by that definition, you're venerating it. And so to say what is authentic, you know, I think authentic doesn't mean copying something that already exists. In fact, that's the opposite of authentic. The idea of originality is to be true to yourself and true to your connection to the divine. And that's the whole principle of Taoist magic to begin with, right? So as long as you use sigil crafting to connect to your concept of divinity, and it happens to be through Chinese characters or through sigil crafting, then I think that is as authentic as it can possibly be. Awesome. There's a lot of there's a lot of conversations going on around cultural appropriation. I don't know if you've been seeing a lot of it online. Um, yeah, but I I agree. I mean, there's a difference between going out on ha Halloween and you know wearing it and a ceremonial headdress or having a racist costume um, or it being represented in Hollywood, right? Because that's not spiritual. That's not right. Whereas if I'm doing a, a sage ceremony or a, sm a smudging ceremony in circle that is spiritual. I'm doing it from the space of actually honoring the plant energy, the devic energy and the ancestral energy that comes with that. So I agree. I think a lot of the, I mean, when you're talking about online, I, I quietly and personally disagree with a lot of the assertions people make about cultural appropriation. I think it, it really um, discourages people from fully and freely exploring their own spirituality. Um, where I'm coming from in terms of my beliefs, my religious beliefs, I do believe in reincarnation in past lives. I really believe that to say you are white or Asian or like, I, I just don't think it's, it's very fluid. I just don't think it's that rigid. Mm -hmm. And especially in the age of globalism, I mean, from a young age, you're influenced by so many cultures on a subconscious level, you don't even really we know it so i think we have to be very careful about how we talk about cultural appropriation especially in the spiritual yeah. community we never want to limit people right and i mean if we i mean being wiccan heck all of it has come from somewhere else it was not that was a, it's a reconstruction so right. it, that's not even um an original thought if you think about it so but yeah it, i totally agree and if we if we look at spirit from a very pure perspective however you want to define god or, or or energy it is just that there's nothing separate in a, in a spiritual from a spiritual perspective we're all connected so yeah I, I totally agree i think i recently saw a conversation or a debate about guan yin you know the goddess of yes Earth. oh yes um, yeah they were saying is guan yin a bodhisattva or a goddess can you refer to her as a goddess and some people were getting very offended that you know some people might refer to guan yin as a goddess and i think if okay first of all if you understand the spirit and ethos of guan yin she, she's this deity this divine energy of compassion and just understanding all of the you know the the, the the spiritual texts and scriptures associated with Guan Yin, to be quite frank, I don't think he or she would care. You know? <laughs> and so to have this conversation in and of itself is really diverging from the spirit and the essence of Guan Yin. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And then also I think to say goddess or to say Bodhisattva, I just, I'm not, the, I just don't care. I don't get that picky about it. I think we all understand what we're talking about. If you say Bodhisattva, if you say goddess, at the end of the day, we know what we're talking about. And if we can communicate to each other about going in and celebrate her, I don't see a problem. So I don't right. like that debate. And I don't like how people be like, oh, you have to call her this, or you have to be authentic to how one culture. Well, which culture? Is she, is she female or is she male? So if you're talking about the culture, it's very difficult to say what is authentic. And so to have that conversation, I think to a certain extent shows ignorance of history. And to another extent, it's just a very narrow mind way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I, I can just imagine I have this like mental picture of the gods, you know, like the, 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 con the conscious construct of the gods sitting up wherever they are going fighting like preschool children about how we're like interacting with them like oh no i don't think that's what's going 
I don't think that's what's going on, folks. <laughs> I agree. I don't care. I don't really think that Jesus cares if you light incense and run around the house, you know, cleansing. Like, Jesus does not care. Like, I yeah, a, a very interesting um, things happen online. <laughs> so, what are some of the ways that um, we can uh, we can use this as a as a modern um, addition to like working with craft and working with our magical selves? So, what are some of the things that we can do with this? I mean, there's some such cool sigils. I know sigils are. Uh, so uh, I see it a lot, especially on Tumblr. So I know there's a lot of people who'd be very interested in this book. But uh, yeah, what are some of the ways that we can actually work with this? I think I'll talk about it in two separate th uh, threads. One is the mundane, and one's the more spiritual. Perfect. On a mundane level, um, one of the things that is the most, the greatest hindrance to us sort of um, achieving our goals is really the lack of definition for what it is our goal, what our goal is. And so I think a sigil, even if you can't define it or write it out in a sentence, a sigil, when you're, when you're rendering it, it's the intention going into it, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, mm -hmm. and those thousand words is defining your intention, what you want, your, what you want to manifest in your life. And so drafting a sigil is concretizing or solidifying what it is you want out of life. And I think right there, forgetting all of the magic, forgetting the craft or metaphysical component, that by itself is incredibly powerful to be able to sort of, you know, define what it is you want and look at it as a picture, the thousand words that the picture represents, you know, to have that. And then to, when you activate it, when you keep it nearby, it's the constant reinforcement of what it is that you want out of life, you're more likely to pursue it. And so from the mundane level, it really helps, I feel like, achieve prosperity, um, you know, employment, get what it is that you want from life, you know, from a material perspective, because you are solidifying those goals. On a spiritual perspective, so um, the Chinese believe, and well, this is going back to sort of the Chinese mythos and the Taoist mythos. They believe that um, during the invention, when writing was invented four or 5,000 plus years ago, um, it was the way that man could communicate with the gods. And so it's through writing that we can communicate to both heaven and hell, like through the various spirit, re spirit realms, is writing that and writing and sigil crafting that connects us. And so using sigil crafting to connect to your concepts of divinity is something that helps. Now, there's many, many ways we connect to divine. Even in the Taoist, you know, tradition, it's not just only through writing, but it is sort of argued as the easiest way to, you know, connect with divinity. So I think part of your craft, part of your practice, you use some form of sigil crafting using the principles, the very basic fundamental science of sigil crafting and incorporating that into your tradition can help you connect closer to your divine or your concept of the divine. I love that. That's amazing. Um, it's interesting when you do, and I know that you're very similar, that you're very interested in a lot of different cultures and you look at the way in which they interact with the divine, how many cultures have that connection of writing as being a sacred act? Like the ancient Egyptians, there were only so many people who could learn how to write and how to read. So, yeah, it's really interesting um, thing and if anyone who channels like I've, I've done a lot of channel writing as well that you get into that flow of just like I feel like this isn't coming from me anymore like I'm just in them with the muse right like I'm totally in the flow so. I think Sigmund Freud in 1916 said that um, in the beginning words and magic were one and the same and so I think that is also, so this idea that writing is magical, that writing is divine is also part of the Western consciousness. Oh, totally. Absolutely. And there's a, a lot of magical texts that talk about knowing the true name of things. Yeah. And hence the reason why people would go uh, with craft names or they would have a different name or they would throw an illusion over it. Because if you knew the name of something, if you knew what it was at its core, you could manipulate it. So yeah, there's some very interesting things around um yeah around text and around writing and sigils there are western i mean we do western sigils as well so using you can use maps and you can use all sorts of things for um different sigil craft and it is incredibly powerful to that subconscious right that has maybe forgotten um your your monkey mind has forgotten that you've you've set this intention but the, the subconscious will always get that that link yeah. It'll fire that link the second it sees the sigil. Exactly. 
So do you recommend for people who are um, working with sigils, where do you recommend that they have them or keep them, display them? What, what are your sort of personal tips and tricks for that? Um, so in the book, I try to be objective. And so I try to take it from a more, I hate to say academic, but I do try to look at history and I look at culture. And so instead of saying I do this or I do that, I say, well, if you look at this, you know, text from the 14th century, this alchemist says we do this. And this alchemist over here, and this ceremonial magician says this lineage does that. So I try to take it from that perspective. And I'll say, culturally, this is what I've seen. If you observe the culture and the practice of it on like, you know, the ground level, this is how it's activated. This is what some people do. They'll post it here, they'll post it there. And so I do that for a reason, because I think you need to figure it out for yourself, what works for you. So, you know, for example, I was talking about a prosperity sigil a while back, and I was saying how I put it in my day planner, because that day planner is my personal Bible. I take that thing everywhere it has my to-do list and so it makes sense for you know a prosperity sigil to be in my day planner mm -hmm. but if your day planner sits in the corner of your desk you know collecting dust <laughs> it makes no sense for you to put it there does that you know what I mean oh totally right and if you own a store then you would put it in your cash box for me it doesn't I don't I don't even have a cash box so it doesn't make right. sense right I can't tell you where to put it you know, mm -hmm. so I don't have any tips and tricks. My tips and tricks is to study and learn and really read how many, many people do it. And then after you've learned how many, many different people with many diverse voices and their point of views, how that is done, then come up with your own idea. I like that. That's great. I think for me, um, I always look for, uh, what makes sense sympathetically so when we're talking about like sympathetic magic so like you were saying if you have a prosperity sigil okay so what for you means prosperity because we all have different values right so where would that be so for me that would be like in my workspace or my wallet or something like that because i don't have a cash box either um so yeah no i totally get it and looking at the connections maybe from a vibrational standpoint too so if you're looking at a sigil for something like a protection sigil a lot of the you know be great on the front, your front door right or your car areas that need protection so yeah I, I guess that's for me coming from a very western perspective too from a western magic perspective of synthetic magic no, it's the same here too i think what's funny is there's if you if you go through the Tao of craft even though it is taking it is using eastern vocabulary a lot of it is going to resonate with western practitioners and a lot of it is very similar to um, western esoteric principles and so yeah there is this idea of i think that's a form of science a form of like collective intuition so yeah I, I don't think i need to tell somebody where to right. be, that's going to be most sympathetic to their needs and their you know their you know their, yeah, their needs so yeah i think it's intuitive in a way awesome was there is there anything happening in the works for you next i mean what are you going to be working on now that you've gifted us with these amazing amazing <laughs> tomes of work um, well, I continue to write. So right now I'm working, um, there's two books in the works. I'm not sure which direction I want. Like I, I mentioned, I do have like, you know, 100,000 words for a phone say book that I just haven't, you know, taken to completion. Um, I, I did a translation of the I Ching, so I wasn't sure if I wanted to turn that into a book. <laughs> and I wanted to write on astrology, which is a Western, you know, Western Hellenistic astrology. Mm -hmm. so I'm just working on books and, you know, all the while doing readings and connecting with people. So how do you, uh, kind of diverging a little bit away from, from your new book, but how do you do it all? So like I, you know, you live a, a, a busy professional life. You have a very busy life as an author and as a well-known reader. How, what, how do you do it all? Or what can you kind of, I guess I get a lot of people who get overwhelmed, right? They see us doing the work and they kind of just go, holy crap, like how do you do it? So what are your, um, what are your things on basically being able to do it all or have it all? I think for me, it really goes back to the day planner. Um, I know I, I plan everything and I have many, many to-do lists. And it's not just about having a to-do list, but I'll put it in the planner. I'll put it, you know, for Tuesday, what I need to achieve by Tuesday, what I need to achieve by Saturday, what I need to achieve. And if I don't, let's say I have a to-do list for Tuesday. If I don't do it on Tuesday, I don't just like throw up my hands and that's the end of it. I, I table it to Wednesday. I table it to Thursday. And if you constantly have to manually shift that goal, at some point you say to yourself, 
wait a second, what yeah. the heck? So you're going to do it. Um, I think for me, it's, I think a lot of it has to do with the discipline I was inst that was instilled in me from a very young age. You know, have you heard of like the tiger mother, you know, that whole idea? So I think from a very young age, I was doing a million different things. I was playing the piano, the violin, I was going to like dance, like I was doing tons of different things. I think that carried over into my adulthood. Right. That, but really I think it's the to-do to list and I think passion. Mm -hmm. Knowing, having a priority list, knowing what your passions are. And so for me, you know, some passions, it's, you know, to put food on the table, so to speak, for my family. And so there's a career aspect that is my passion, even though that itself isn't my passion. And writing is my passion. So I think if you know where your passions lie and you focus on that passion, that energy, and use passion as a magic, you know, mm -hmm. as a magic to, you know, push you forward. I think that really helps. Right. It's so, it's so, so true. Um, I love everything you just said, by, <laughs> by the way. It's like, and there's nothing wrong with, um, there's nothing wrong with having the job that puts the roof over your head and the clothes on your family's back and feeds you. There's nothing wrong with having that. And then having a more esoteric or having a more soul aligned. Um, it's not disempowering. It's not that you're being inauthentic. There's nothing to do with that. Like I enjoyed my, a lot of my corporate work when I was doing it. it I felt powerful. I was in a position where I was being strategic. I was using different parts of my brain, but then the other side, yeah, it does feed a different a form, but um, yeah, the passion is so important and it's okay if it wanes sometimes or if you need to recharge, but you've got to keep coming back to it. And I am a list freak. I am so all about that. So I really, uh, really enjoy, really enjoy that. So um, I just, I had another question. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, because I'm very much into working with uh, elemental aspects and elemental dignitaries. So does this come into play? I, I've kind of seen it. <laughs> like I'm just like leading you down there. Um, how does that come into play working with the, um, the elements uh, in the book? Well, so in the Taoist uh, cosmology, you have the wuxing, the five, we say elements, but it's really more a concept of five forms of change. So the, the principle is that existence universe life matter what you see is all change you know so even though a glass cup looks fixed to your eyes to your naked eye it looks fixed it's actually moving it's in a form of phase and so that actually has been proven by mm -hmm. science you yes, know so so the idea is that the five quote unquote elements represent five phases. So you see everything through phases. And what if something is in one particular phase, a different kind of phase or different kind of energy or force field can either increase it and amplify it or decrease it or disempower it. And so like the th fundamentals of magic is to like, you know how you say know, your, know the name in order to summon certain you know, uh, entities. The idea crosses over to lower forms of magic, so-called lower forms of magic as well because if you understand the essential nature of something then you understand what it takes to modify that essential nature and so that's what the wuxing is about in terms of elements that might correspond with the alchemical four elements fire water air and earth would probably be the bakwa the eight trigrams of the I Ching. and so then they have the idea of eight and the eight two out of every single of those eight actually in a way can correspond with fire water air which is interesting so it represents the yin and yang of fire the yin and yang of water the yin and so if you look at it that way yeah. it's actually, it does actually correlate and have a crossover with western alchemy so i always found that very interesting and so i work with elements as well but i actually work more closely with the western four elements and so i again it's all about mixing it out right. the four western alchemical elements with my um approach to a form of Taoist craft and i have no problems with that nor do i think that it's you know disingenuous because it's authentic to me and it's very authentic to who i am mm -hmm. and that's all you got to do right like yeah. your intention and being in your own authenticity is so important and i just right. wanted to show um some people who are watching this first of all like if you don't even get the book you've probably learned a lot um but this artwork is all yours isn't it yeah it is <laughs> holy shit man i did not know how freaking talented you were until i started seeing all these pop up on uh you know excuse the swearing um pop up on my facebook i'm just like holy i mean like look they're all a lot of them are from my um book of methods or my personal grimoire 
yeah, your personal book of shadows. Yeah. Love it. So, um, and how can the the people who are watching this and um, my lovely folks who've connected with with me, how can we work with you? What are some of the things that um, you offer? And um, yeah, how can we connect with you? Um, well, through the Tarot Readers Academy, <laughs> there is <Stop> all, <laughs> all the money of the key. Um, you can connect with me through there. Uh, just, I offer a lot of free downloads and a lot of educational materials on my website only because I wanted to share that. I feel like that certain forms of knowledge really needs to be out in the public consciousness. And that's going to, that's kind of what I feel like I'm called to do. And so that's why it's out there. And if people have questions, they can always email me. So that's about it. And I do a couple of different forms of readings, both in tarot and astrology. So if they want to book a reading, they can do that through my website. Yeah. I'm constantly, I'm directing people to your content because I don't know everything. And I feel like that's one of the most amazing things about being on the planet is we don't know everything and I'm an avid learner. Um, But yeah, a lot of what you talk about with the law and it's just an incredible amount of information on your website like you must type so fast <laughs> <laughs> I type pretty fast I do coming out like on speed so there is so much amazing um stuff on your website I'll make sure I put it in the link below um and on my blog uh for everyone to go and check it, check it out um both books are available yes like so they're both in print um like I said I, this is it sits right right there on my bookshelf right near my desk so they're both incredible and I can't wait to really dig into this I'm super excited now even more so that I've spoken to you um and I know that uh, there I have a few friends who are very very interested in in, uh checking this out I'm like look what I've got um so thank you so 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 much is there anything that you want to end with or um any part of it that I missed that's essential for people to know or you didn't miss anything I might end with just um so in terms of the Tao of craft I have a lot of what I refer to as instructables and so there's downloads where you can learn to um you know use the principles in the book and apply it to actual actual step-by-step uh, instructions on how to craft sigils. I didn't put that in the book because I wanted the book to really um, inspire people to find their own path. That's the whole idea. And I felt like if I put a step one, step two, step three, instead I gave case studies and examples, but I didn't really lay it out. And so I did the instructables separately in case you wanted to see how do I do it? Okay, step one, step two, step okay, three. So cool. There's those. And then they have free downloads of all of these sigils. So a lot of the sigils pictured in the book, if you want sort of a copy for yourself or a digital file to work out of, then it's on my website. Wow. I mean, and like that in itself is like, that is incredible information to just give to the world. So, um, and again, you've got, and the same thing with Holistic Tarot. There are so many downloadables if you've got this book and you can see where, um, you point us to your website to, to go and get the downloadable. So it really is a lexicon of tarot. It's incredible. Um, so I'm sure this is exactly the same. So um, thank you so, so much for spending the time um, on your Monday evening to talk to me and to everyone who, who's watching this. And um, I hope you have an amazing evening. You too. Thank you. Thanks.